Yes, I'm honored um, and very happy to introduce Thomas to you today. Um, he is the CEO and co-founder of Vey, one of our portfolio companies, and I think one of the most ambitious deep tech companies we're currently seeing on the European horizon. Um, Thomas has actually launched the Amazon Echo in the US. Um, he has then worked at the first um, sort of driverless car endeavor in, in, the, in the Silicon Valley called Zooks. And then we turned to Europe, of all places, three years ago, to um, found Vey, um, where we picked him up and have been on an incredible journey since. Um, Thomas has now close to 100 people working for him in the headquarters in Berlin. Um, and I think he's actually approaching a very pivotal moment for Europe on launching the first sort of driverless cars on European streets um, very, very soon. So, Thomas, tell us what you do. Awesome. Welcome. I'm very excited to be here today uh, at Slush for the first time. Great to be here, uh, here with you, Jeanette. If you think that autonomous driving is still many years out, um, like many autonomous driving experts, I think we have some exciting news uh, today for all of us. Um, because what we're doing at VEI is a different approach to autonomous driving that allows us to actually put something on the street, not in five years, but actually starting next year. Right? So recently we announced that we'll launch the first worldwide fleet of vehicles without anybody in there on Hamburg streets, actually. Um, so that's going to be some very exciting uh, months and, and, and years ahead of us. And when I talk about a different approach to autonomous driving, it is that we do it differently, differently than, than, as we know, anybody else right now is doing. And we're doing that through a different technology approach, um, which we call teledriving. So teledriving is a technology that allows a person, which we call a teledriver, to remotely control or remotely drive, which we call teledriving, a vehicle. So a person just sees as well, or even better, so the person has 360 degrees vision, has a steering wheel, has brake pedals, uh, and can, can steer a vehicle from afar. And that's the technology that we've uh, been developed over the last three years. And next year, we're going to put this on the streets of Hamburg. And the question is, what, what do we do with this technology? Um, because technology is just there to build products that um, hopefully all of us really love and, and, and enjoy. And, what we'll start with is uh, a service that we call Vey Drive, uh, which works like this. Right? So you download the Vey app, right? uh, um, and uh, you click a button, you get an electric vehicle within a, within a few minutes, wherever you are, uh, and then you, as the customer, still get behind the steering wheel. So you drive that vehicle to the airport, so maybe you want to go from Slush now to the airport, vehicle gets out here, five minutes gets here, you get behind the steering wheel, you drive to the airport, you drive exactly to the gate, and then you just get out, and another teledriver that just finished a teledriving task somewhere else gets back and parks the vehicle, right? So what that means for you as a customer is that's by far, by far the most affordable, since it costs a fraction of an Uber, right? Since you, we, we don't pay anything in the middle because you're, as a customer, are driving at door-to-door -door mobility service, right? So you don't have to look for parking, nor do you have to go, you know, maybe through some cold uh, streets of, uh, of Helsinki to actually find a, a car somewhere. Um, so that's the initial service that we're going to start launching, which, um, yeah, many of us and, and I hope also many of you are very excited to, to have in their hands very soon. And what the exciting thing beyond just this initial service is, is that this technology or this service then allows to extremely bring down the costs of going from A to B in cities, right? And we believe it could go as far as getting close to or even below urban car ownership costs. So then you can decide, do you want to own your own car that you have to maintain, that you have to charge, that you have to clean, right? Or do you just at a click of a button get a car, right, um, that, um, that can get you from A to B and that you don't have to park nor have to, um, uh, nor have to, to find, um, uh, to, to, start, uh, to start it. So what, what we want to offer with this initial service is really a new way to get around and not have to rely on your cars. And that obviously for, for us as a society in cities, if you look, you know, how, how many, first of all, most of the cars are not electric today, so you have a lot of pollution. But more importantly, so many cars are just standing around, not moving, 95% um, uh, of the time blocking streets and uh, uh, that could be just repurposed for other, for other, um, for other uh, purposes for us, you know, to build uh, uh, maybe some, some cafes and others 
of things. So that's why we're really excited to, with this technology, start out and start a service next year, right? And, and then the next thing, then often get okay. This is this is great. What about um, uh, what about if I don't want to drive? Uh, we also have uh, um, an, an answer there that. Obviously, over time, we'll add services where we can teledrive you the entire way, so you don't have to drive yourself, uh, as well as building autonomous driving technology where my background uh, lies, which we also started, started doing and which we're also excited to continue doing over the next uh, couple of years. That's actually a good key point, because I think a lot of people, and I know you get challenged on this a lot, and Thomas, is the fact that people believe full autonomy is only you know, 10 to 20 years away. So why teledriving? Isn't that just a transitory phenomenon? Like, what is your what is your answer to that one? Yeah, we, we often get that. Isn't this a bridge technology, right? And that's 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 an exciting question, right? Because I I really think that we really really have a good shot on showing that there's a different way to autonomous driving, right? If you look at the current approaches to autonomous driving, I would categorize them in two different camps. One is the camp where you maybe have a Tesla, a mobile eye, um, OEMs building autonomous driving technology for car ownership, so they can't cost that much, right? A couple of thousand euros, uh, and then they build out the technology. Then you have other players, such as uh, Waymo, so Google, Zooks, where I was at, uh, Aurora, Cruise, uh, and, uh, and some others that say, okay, we go straight to full autonomy, right, and we can build all kinds of sensors on top of the vehicle, uh, tens or even hundreds of thousands of euros to build that, and then put this in a robo-taxi service and uh, I roll that out. Obviously, both approaches, according to, to, to experts, in urban environments is, is, is many years out, right? And hence, our different approach comes in, um, where we say, hey, we want to launch something, not in five years, but actually next year, right? And we want to launch a service that customers love, right? That, that, that cities uh, that we talk to really like too, because a person is still in control of the vehicle in a one-to-one -one relation, giving comfort, right? And then taking that and scaling that, right? So at that point, it's no, no, no autonomy, right? But what teledriving allows us to do is that then over time, we can add autonomous driving features. So if you think about the autonomous driving problem as a whole, right? It's you can slice it down, right? Like going straight is easier than intersections, it's easier than unprotected left turns, double parked vehicles, all these very difficult maneuvers um, um, and edge cases that, that hold us back from rolling out autonomous driving today, right? And teledriving allows to say, okay, we, 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 we say, what are the easiest features? So let's say uh, going straight on highways, right? Or just going straight in, in let's say, suburban areas, right? And we do these autonomously, right? And the, the moments we have that, we actually launch it. A and then the moment you maybe get off the highway, you have a teledriver come in to then do the rest and more difficult, uh, diff diff um, um, more difficult parts, but still with a human in the loop. And hence, we have a complete end-to-end -end experience for the customer that doesn't maybe even realize what is done by a human, what is done by the machine. And we really go into a hybrid model in the next, uh, in, in the next decade, where a machine and a person just works very nicely together to roll out autonomous driving features, and that's yeah, that's that's what we call our teledrive first autonomous driving rollout. Um, that I'm yeah very excited to have the chance to 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 pursue here in Europe. Yeah, I think it's interesting also because I think for a user it will be quite um, quite a new feeling to be getting into a car that is actually not steered by a human. And I think you probably will be a smoother transition to that experience um, in, in the future. But I think looking at the landscape of, of autonomous vehicles, it seems that we have seen a lot of these pop up in Israel and in the US. But there are very few contenders in Europe. Where do you think that is? <laughs> yeah, that's a good, also a good question. It's um, so it's a bit of an hype hypothesis. I, um, I, I, I think how a lot of the autonomous driving technology actually evolved. So we, we have a, a big cluster in the Silicon Valley, right? And I think a lot of the ideas how we should solve autonomous driving came out of a small group of people, right? Which was the Stanford Lab uh, with Sebastian Schoon, um, uh, also from, from, from Europe, then uh, kind of taking that to Google, that, which then became Waymo, and then you had Aurora, you have Zooks, you know, you have, you have many other uh, companies spun out of the idea of saying, hey, we have to put 360 degree LiDARs on top, um, and, um, uh, which is a very expensive sensor, and we have to do a robotaxi and just engineer it all the way, right, which is a big step. 
Uh, and the challenge with that approach is just extremely expensive, right? So uh, you, you had this uh, kind of this, this core group, a lot of kind of money was poured into, and we haven't seen the results, at least when I joined Zoox, we we're, we we're like, I, I was so excited because it, it's such a positive change for us, uh, for us as a society to join and say, hey, in 2020, we have autonomous driving everywhere, right? And, but obviously that, that hasn't realized because it's just so much harder to do that. And what happened then is a lot of capital, I, I believe this is all hi hypothesis, right? Or, or, or my thoughts. Uh, as a lot of venture capital went into these few companies, right, burning 10 million every week, 10 million, without knowing when to launch, right? And 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 so I, I think a lot of capital focused on a, on a few companies that happened now over the last, let's say, f four or five years, uh, and um, we didn't really have kind of a company. And maybe also we should also talk about kind of the venture capital funding for such companies here in Europe, yeah. which just didn't evolve, and hence, like I, I believe, for that reason, we didn't we didn't have kind of that approach to autonomous driving coming out of Europe um, and um, yeah yeah but I think it's what, what I what I got struck by by you initially was really your vision for Europe right I think you could could have built this in the US you could have built this where you were and maybe the conditions would have been a bit more favorable right I think traditionally the US has have been always a little bit more um, you know ambitious and more uh, risk um, you know more risk taking when it comes to funding these like very very long term bets I think in Europe what we see with a lot of these like you know, deep tech um, companies is that they usually have to find you know foreign capital uh, mainly you know, sort of US capital or Asian capital to, to, to fund them, which is actually a shame because if you look at Europe, we have such an amazing you know, landscape of universities. A lot of the sort of groundbreaking research actually happens in our labs. And then we have Germans that, you know, like Sebastian, who end up in the US and just stay there. Um, so you came back to Europe and what, what kind of, where is this European patriotism rooted for? And like, where do you think <laughs> Europe um, will, will go with this over the next 10 years? So, so the background of that is I'm, I'm German originally, right? And I had my first company after uh, undergrad. I, I, I studied at the, at the KIT in Karlsruhe. And I had my first company there. Um, uh, and uh, we did that for two years. We learned a lot uh, how to do companies and maybe what not to do. And then I decided always uh, at that point say, okay, I, I want to learn how to do that, right? From a technology perspective as well as from, um, from, from an entrepreneurship perspective. And I decided to go to the States, to the Valley, to actually learn from the best. And, and I ended up over there then six years. I only wanted to do my master's there and then come back. But it was just a very exciting environment and I, I like it, it's it, it's it was a fantastic experience both actually the studies uh, as well as then the, the the professional experience but always in mind that I wanted to come back and and um, build something exciting and and unique and new out of Europe right because we see a lot of um, and it's getting much much better and I, I just would love to encourage everyone to 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 also you know think big and, and build new new companies out of Europe because there's what we saw a lot in, in the past is that we take maybe models from the US, right, and, and roll them out here in Europe. But um, I, I think it's extremely, extremely important to also focus and build kind of new frontier tech out of Europe to ensure that we as a continent with our values and our ethics can, you know, in the, in the, in the future be on, on eye level with the US and China. And, and that really, like, really, that was, that was what, always what, what motivated me to then, um, yeah, to, 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 then, to, to, to then eventually come back. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to maybe help, like help with a small part um, uh, to, to achieve that. And what sets a spark for Vey? So how, how, how this started is, uh, I, 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 so I, I, I left Amazon, so I did my master's in computer science and, and, and product at Stanford and then moved uh, to, to consumer electronics for a few years uh, at Amazon, um, working on, yeah, things that you might not know, which is the Fire Phone, for example. Um, people know then the other product that, that, uh, that I was fortunate enough to work on, which then became the Amazon Echo when we launched it, and then I, uh, really wanted to go back to mobility, and then I, I, I basically got approached by this company, which called Zooks, which nobody at the time really knew. It was uh, kind of a stealth startup, uh, and I, I, I just really wanted to go back to mobility, where my passion is. And 
when I joined, it's 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 a, it's great, right? To the, the, the company, it's great. It's a fantastic team, a great vision, building their own cars, right, from from the ground up, and, and really, you know, rolling this out. And that's that's what got me hooked, right? And and joined that company, which I would encourage everyone in in the deep tech space to really think why why do you do that and what do you want to achieve with that? Because that just makes it so much easier to track capital, but more importantly, to build an amazing team around you, um, to pursue to pursue that. And that was the reason why I joined Zooks because their vision of you know autonomous driving and what that meant and building a vehicle from the ground up was great. Then having been there, I realized very quickly that it's just so difficult to roll that out, right? Um, in the sense that we're still years away, or it, I, I, I don't have all the insights at, at this point anymore, but it was very unclear how, how to actually do that, right? Uh, and it felt like we are building something. So how, how, if, if I think about product development or lean startups or design thinking, you really want to start building something and start putting something out and start iterating, right? And that just felt very different in the autonomous driving space where you say, okay, we want billions of dollars to build something that then maybe, you know, in, in five, six or eight years happens. And I realized that. And then there was, there was kind of this, in this autonomous driving complex, there's a technology which is teleoperations, right? Which is similar to what we're doing, which are used for edge cases for autonomous driving companies. And I, I took that and thought, hey, this is such a great uh, a co concept, it's very used differently at low speeds and just in edge cases, five kilometers per hour, and say, hey, what if we take this to the next level and just launch something, right? Um, because in the end, it's a similar experience for the customer, and that's, um, yeah, that's what we, what we, what we then, uh, uh, what we decided to do, uh, and focus on that technology as our core technology that we've now developed um, to, to start it. I love how you say just launch something, because I think, you know, having, having um, seen you since the beginning, um, I think you were faced with an extraordinary, like, multi-dimensional complexity for a company, right? I think most companies maybe have one of these dimensions to digest and to tackle. I think you had the regulatory challenge, which is, I think there were a couple of pointers early on, because um, actually in Europe they said you, there has to be a driver in control of the car at all times when we did our diligence, but it didn't say that the driver had to be in the car. So I think that was an initial kind of pointer towards regulation actually being favorable or being able to kind of, you know, digest this. But still, you know, that the regulatory environment isn't easy, especially in Europe. It's much harder here than in the US. Um, then you had the, you know, very, like, wide-ranging variety of, of technological challenges, right? On the hardware side, you had to build, like, automotive-grade hardware um, which, in, in, in especially in Germany, is is is, um, is something tough, right? That the Bosches and the Continentals of this world have actually, you know, really kind of, uh, you know, developed uh, the 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 skill to do that over the last centuries. Um, and then, obviously, you ultimately also want to build a consumer-facing brand, right? Um, now, looking at your journey until now, what are the kind of key learnings? And can you maybe dissect like these different def different dimensions a little bit for us? Yeah. It's hard, actually, to like. It's it's, it's from the outside. Is uh, it's it always says, hey, you started here and now you're launching. It must be great, right? But it's it's actually really hard, and um, it was not like it was really not easy. It's it's the technology itself is definitely easier than autonomous driving, but obviously it's technology. That nobody there's no courses online. There's like, there's no fra regulatory framework. Every city or, or country we talk to, nobody you know thought about this, unlike autonomous driving, for example. So as you said, right, like we really, in order to make this work, right, we have to basically had to get multiple streams in parallel to work together, right? Uh, so on the regulatory front, right, because we did we, we didn't know can we launch this in, in Germany, in in or or in Europe? Um, um, what what about obviously we have uh, a network and low latency video streaming that is an extremely kind of big stream that we had to focus, including all the maps and uh, a lot of data engineering that we had to build on the site. Um, then the automotive grade uh, hardware, so we we had to build a. We call this a teledrive station. So the job of the future, the teledriver, uh, would work at a teledrive station. Uh, uh, we, we had to bu build that. And then the, f the fourth item is, is the, 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 the consumer brand. And all these things having to work together in parallel, right? And that's just I extremely um, uh, uh, challenging. So well, what we did is uh, we pushed just full, like, like full speed everything in parallel. Um, on the regulatory front, um, I think it's always um, important, you know, to have multiple backups. So we had mu really multiple times where it's like, okay, 
we're going to do this, but we, we, we also, and it's hard at that point, to do a second parallel path, right, on technology, like we had one kind of main interface we wanted to go with, and then we had a, a parallel path as a backup, right, on the regulatory front, um, we, we looked at over seven different jurisdictions, so seven different countries, and on all the different cities um, uh, uh, in, in, in Europe, but also in the US, uh, to you know, ensure that we have just backups, right, um, um, and that is, it's, it's, it's quite a challenge to do this with, with a relatively small, a small team. Um, and then not everything came, you know, like you have to push everything at the same time forward. And yeah, that's, 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 that's definitely complexity, right? And that's, that's a big strain, um, I think, on everyone's, you know, working, working mind, but in, also in a, in a small team, having highly complex things going on in parallel, it's not always easy uh, to handle. And, yeah, it's, it's one is having kind of multiple paths, and now we have not only a backup plan, but it turned out that it actually works, right? So we're, we're launching here in Europe, and then also very quickly go to the US, so it's not a backup, but it's actually now our growth story. And um, uh, on the technology front, um, also we, we made some, some good, good improvements over the last um, a couple of months that now makes us comfortable to actually launch next year. Yeah, and I think it's, it's obviously always a team effort, but how do you find the talent here in Europe? Like, what is your... Um, um, what analogy would you draw to having worked in the US, having worked with very talented people there, and then kind of how do you find the talent landscape in Europe and how has that benefited Re? Or yeah. So every, everything that I just described, like it's, it's the most important thing is the team, right? Like, and it's, it's so, I, I'm just so fortunate to have my colleagues. So you mentioned uh, we're, we're close to 100 people now. Uh, like we, we were able to, you know, get on board like really, really fantastic f folks that have a great experience actually, um, but also have the drive and the vision to, to, to change something and that's just by far the most important thing, right? And um, so that's one. The other thing um, I, I think that helped us a lot is very early on, um, uh, uh, we, we had great early backers, right? So uh, um, we got introduced through La Familia to, 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 to my, my co-founder, who then also came back from the valley and helped us on the auto automotive uh, engineering side of things. We had um, a deep tech entrepreneur that like, I had de like weekly, weekly meetings in the very beginning. Our Series A we did then with uh, Atomico as the lead investor where we then had Neil Was who ran Uber internationally, so really helped us on the operational side to really think about how we structure that. So I think, I know often people say like, are investors useful or like advisors for, for us? I can definitely say they were uh, and we um, uh, and, and we wouldn't have like I, I think I have quite like like high high ambitions. At the same time, we all pushed each other to to really think big, and to yet yeah, to do um, yeah all these things in this very short amount of time. Um, so that's that, that's that. To your question, how do we actually get the talent? Right, it's like they don't apply, <laughs> and I, I don't know the the exact. Uh, kind of setup here of the audience, but if there's uh, like I assume there's many founders here. Is it's a lot of work. Uh, it's a lot of grind. Like sit down, like source, right, or find recruiters, work with them. Where are great companies to source from, right? Or source meaning that you know you look at LinkedIn, you look at all the uh, all, all, all the employees that work at a, a certain company. Um, you you know m make it nice. You have uh, a short amount of time where you say hey. Maybe you want to click on this link and then you have some cool videos and a bit of the background. So, because in the beginning we were still in stealth, right? Uh, still, we just came like recently out of stealth. So, uh, we're, we're not, you know, we're not a Google. Um, and uh, I, I think building like the right reach out messages, building great, like, you know, interesting slides or videos uh, about what we're doing, but also about the culture, I think is extremely important. And it's just a lot, a lot of work, right? So, yeah. I, I spent. Um, yeah, many, 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 many hours, and I still do basically on on, on uh, finding the right talent. Yeah. And what were the biggest learnings? Because I mean, it's, it's it's been it's been quite the journey, um, but I think I think there were many, many challenges, many learnings. Do you want to talk a little bit about maybe the the, the three core ones that you want to share with the founders in the audience? Yeah, I think a deep tech. Um, what's always good is to have uh, enough cash, <laughs> so it, it's it can go like different 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 paths. So. I, I often like get asked, okay, should I add more money or you know dilute less? 
uh, and uh, I, I think in, in particular in the early days, I would always go for let's try, you know, make sure that you have enough like buffer to run runway to you know overcome challenges. That's definitely that's definitely one. Um, and the other one, um, yeah, just really focus on on, on an experienced team and uh, this advisor set up very early on. If you don't know folks, just reach out, you know, to to, to founder networks or through your investors who are the great folks to really get on board, get excited, uh, incentivize all well, uh, and uh, uh, and yeah, uh, then I think you're 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 in a good spot. And just keep going, right? It's 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 really it's 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 not it's not easy, um, and there's many things being thrown your way. So uh, I think you just have to keep on pushing and, and and going. And one final word on the journey ahead. I'm just super excited, right, about the next year and the years to come to launch this service for us, right? We've been working super hard on that, uh, and just you know having something that you know like drives around without any person in sight and finally get that on the street and uh, and then after that um, uh, the, the next year kind of roll it out globally and get it into you know all, all the, the users and uh, you know cities hands it's just something something extremely excited and yeah, I, I'm just very fortunate that I have now this team and this opportunity to, to do that and uh, yeah so so in the future we will get to this venue on, on bay vehicles yeah. <laughs> thank you Thomas it was really insightful Awesome, thank you.